Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from California, the place that's burning right now. Uh, I have a great pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Victoria Sork, who is the director of the UCLA Botanical Gardens. Uh, she was Dean of Life Sciences for the past 11 years and just stepped down. So we actually found the time to talk to her. <laughs> if it was a little a couple of weeks ago, we probably wouldn't have you here, right? Uh, so now she is uh, back to being a distinguished professor of ecology and evolutionary biology. Um, I will just introduce a tiny bit about her work that's super fascinating to us. Uh, and her work in ecology, genetic of trees. Actually, she's been working in genetics of trees for the past 20 years, and not just locally, but around the world. So she moves from a very reductionist way of looking at genetics and trees, conservation, climate change, to a larger scale, to thinking more holistically. Um, and we started our conversation, I would say, in January, is that right? Something yeah. like that. When the world was a different place uh, to think about uh, what can we do in the garden and let's do some art science projects and just uh, open it up because uh, you just renovated part of the building and the botanical gardens. And then everything shifted. So when we got this invitation from Ars Electronica to be part of Kepler's gardens, I thought this is so perfect. So we went back to the botanical gardens, to Victoria Sork, and you were very, very generous opening your doors to us. And uh, the conversation again started becoming more and more interesting as we're shifting in our whole world. Um, and here we are. So we're going to uh, talk a little bit about our current situation, and then you'll give us a little walk through the garden, and then we'll see if anybody from the audience wants to chime in. So welcome, Victoria Sork, and thank you for being here. Well, it's really wonderful to be part of this whole um, amazing festival of, of uh, events. So tell us uh, a little bit about uh, the current situation uh, that we're facing, especially thinking of um, so many trees and forests dying and thinking of the trees as a network, which you do, and how, how you're seeing it through your perspective. So first of all, I see fire as a natural process. So the fact that just having a single site burn to me is okay. This is way in which uh, fires have happened. Uh, ecosystems are accustomed to re re rejuvenating themselves and living with fires. So one could say, well, it's fascinating to see what kind of adaptations the plants have to fire, which species do well, actually are triggered by fire. So over time, I've always thought of fire just as an interesting way to promote the diversity and to be part of the ways in which nature structures um, itself. However, the fires that we're seeing now are happening with such great frequency that it's really testing how nature responds to them. So the current fires that we're seeing in California, uh, they range from a fire in Joshua Tree, which is in the southern part of our state in the desert, one would normally not think of fires there, and therefore that ecosystem is really not accustomed to fires. Um, we go up to the conifer coniferous forest up in the high elevation, and those fires are happening uh, because of human disturbance. And it's, it's just a multitude of factors. One factor that affects uh, is that the way in which the Forest Service is managing the forest and managing it for tree populations is actually promoting the spread of fire. So the way in which humans manage an ecosystem can either promote or um, perhaps reduce the likelihood of fire. Uh, so here we have a fire that spread really, really rapidly because the tree plantation was managed in the way that it was managed. On the other hand, climate change is influencing fire because, because of the increased temperatures 
you've got drier wood, drier vegetation that can actually a uh, lightning strike, which happens all the time, except now that it's ready to be kindled. And then of course, yet another fire is a uh, cause of fire is also human, which is that the frequency that fires are started by humans is certainly far greater than the frequency of lightning strikes before climate warming, before humans came along. Uh, so we have a multitude of sort of an interaction between natural phenomenon and then increased frequencies uh, of, the, of the starting of the fires, which many times is humans, and then in certainly the increased likelihood that they can spread. So I just want to summarize by saying, I don't automatically go into a response like, oh my gosh, this fire is terrible. Mm -hmm. However, when I see these fires happening that are so hot mm -hmm. and are happening at such high frequency that it's got to be very hard for the ecosystem to, to come back um, the ways they would have under their historic conditions. That's where I, I get concerned. Yes, I'm very close here to the desert now, and um, I heard and looked at some photos of the Joshua Tree National Park and how much of those trees died. And they say that they can't even return, that it takes so, so many years for them to evolve. What are your thoughts about that? Of course, I will always preface being the academic that I'm not a, an expert on the Joshua Tree, but I will say, Yes, they are very long lived and they're not particularly fire adapted. They're, they're adapted to live under drought conditions, but not necessarily fire. So it's going to have to be seedlings and saplings that, that recover. And I've never even looked at uh, studies of the Joshua tree and see what is its uh, natural regeneration. Um, but certainly fire, they're not the fire adapted trees. If you were to ask me that question about the chaparral, which is a fire adapted ecosystem, uh, I would say that many of them do have a chance mm -hmm. to, to regenerate. They've got seeds that will germinate. They have already saplings. The difference there is when the fires get really hot and the chaparral forest, um, like they're doing, they're actually challenging those fire adapted species. And what about uh, places like Brazil, where we see these huge deforestations happening and uh, these animals and bird species just being devastated. It's another heart-wrenching scene it, for me. It, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart partly, uh, you know, there's two regions that are, that are, um, um, uh, that are, be, that are under fire. Both of them have um, fires that have been started by humans. You know, people that want to increase the clearing so they can make ranches and do farming. Uh, that's true in the uh, tropical forest. It's also true in the wetlands um, where your know, ranchers and farmers will do is deliberately burn some area to clear it. And it's, you know, that's a traditional way of clearing a forest of humans as long as humans have been those forests. The difference now, of course, is we have more humans and instead of just making a fire and clearing a little patch to make a small field, they're now trying to do is clear larger patches. And then of course the fire, when you're clearing larger areas has more chance to get out of control. And um, some people speculated the government in Brazil has been ha willing to let them keep burning and burning because the more open area, the more they can replant it with more uh, economically beneficial species. Um, yeah, for cow grazing apparently. That's, yeah, yeah. and. You know, then our whole, you know, uh, carbon cycle, mm -hmm. uh, you know, worldwide carbon is being, which it used to be that was a wonderful sink. Uh, we're now losing all of that biomass um, mm -hmm. for the carbon um, cycling. So now to go to your uh, <laughs> to your comfort zone academically, uh, you have been doing amazing research on oak trees and. Um, without talking much about it from my side, I just find it fascinating that these trees have been around for over 50 million years and that you're looking into genetics, which is very current, uh, but for a while, to look at what's going on currently. Could you talk a little bit uh, in detail about that research? Because it's 
really fascinating to me and I'm sure the audiences would appreciate it. I think, um, I think so many of us, when we look at an ecosystem and we look at the current system, I don't think we realize that all of those species within them have a complete history, their evolutionary history. Um, oaks to me are very interesting because every ecosystem they occur, they pretty much define the ecosystem. If you take away the oaks, you take away that ecosystem. So that makes them a very important type of tree species. Now, what it became interesting for me is with all of the modern tools and modern genomics where we can sequence the entire DNA you know, of, of an individual tree, and from one single tree, I can look back into 50 million years of history is absolutely uh, fascinating. And it just opens doors that early in my career, I never would have been able to go through. So what can we do? We can look at these sequences and we can get sort of infer, has this, have these species had large populations, small populations? How have they responded to climate change? 50 million years ago, the whole, all of the planet was warm. It was tropical, subtropical weather. So oaks actually started out in with a large uh, paleoarctic distribution. You can find fossils there, but I can go back and see that originally at that time, populations were much, much, much bigger because those nice, wet, warm, tropical conditions were very advantageous for trees. Mm -hmm. So that part's, it's interesting to look at the evolutionary history by just getting the DNA of a single tree um, which is what we've, what we've done. Now, go ahead. So I'm actually curious how you got into genetics. What were you, did you study this or did you learn it as you went along? Well, you were way ahead of the curve in many ways. Well, I think, um, actually I, uh, thought of genetics as always giving us kind of a background. So while I started out interested in the ecology of trees, what, you know, what makes them grow and survive, I started realizing that the genes tell us a lot, lot more about the trees. So for instance, you have a whole distribution of oaks in California. Well, how different are, is every oak the same? You know, a rose is a rose is a rose, is it all the same? And it turns out if you look at the genetics, you start seeing, oh my goodness, that trees that are growing in Southern California have a very, very different genetic composition than trees in the Northern part of California. And then you can start seeing, oh, so the trees are different. How does that make a difference in how they grow? How have they evolved? How have they survived in their local environment? And to quote another, I, I think there's so many interesting common sayings, like you bloom where you grow, well, you can only bloom where you grow if you have the right genetics uh -huh. to bloom in that spot. Uh -huh. And so over time, what natural selection has done is it's taken all of this genetic variation and it selects the kinds of genes that will allow you to do well where you planted. If you think about a tree like an oak can live 500 years, right? So once that little seed lands, from that point on, it can't move. Mm. So trees have to be able to really put up with a lot of stresses throughout their lifespan. Mm -hmm. And we can get a sense of how do they do that. So for instance, trees have to be resistant to disease and their fungi, right? Well, they've got to be resistant to the local um, pathogens, you know, the fungi that are pathogenetic. They also have mycorrhizae. That's a type of fungus that helps trees be a network and grow with each other. Mm -hmm. So they have to kind of co-evolve with the mycorrhizae that's local. All of those kinds of stories, in a lifetime, I could not study them. But mm -hmm. I can look at their footprint of what they've done by looking at their genetics. So that's what got me into genetics is I love to be able to see, you know, sort of the history of a, even a tree itself by looking at its genes and learn stories that I would never learn uh, by studying a tree that lives 500 years, even if I got three generations of my family to study them. Um, Speaking of, you mentioned very briefly to me when we were walking through the garden that um, 
oak trees are everywhere around the world and they're always somehow related to societies and rituals and they're incorporated into healing practices and other ways of uh, community sharing. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I guess I've, I've also enjoyed specializing. So while I've always studied trees, I have increasingly specialized in oaks. Oaks are abundant through all the Northern hemisphere. And it is interesting to see how much they have, their use has intertwined into different societies and different uh, human uses. So, um, and to some extent, humans have deliberately learned how to use and sustainably um, take advantage of oaks. But for instance, the acorn, which is a source of, of a kind of flower, uh, for a long time, that was one of the most uh, commonly used food resource by human societies throughout the world. Mm -hmm. The oaks of the, um, the oaks, uh, excuse me, the wood of the oaks has been used for structures, for ships, for, you know, housing, um, for furniture. That's been going on. The wine industry and the evolution of wine, which turns out that the grapes for wine have the similar ecological niche as oak trees. So wherever you see vineyards, you often find oaks. Or unfortunately, a lot of times when you see oaks, you see perhaps too many vineyards because they'll start clearing the area, clearing the oaks. Uh -huh. But the oak wood barrel, of course, um, has been really important in the whole history of winemaking. Um, the cork of oaks mm -hmm. comes from the cork tree. So we've seen, you know, industries. And then there's a lot of uh, spirituality and folklore mm -hmm. around oaks um, and what they bring uh, to society. So I, I've enjoyed working on a species that from an ecological perspective is so important, but then from a human perspective has um, been part of its history. And let's not forget truffles. <laughs> Thank you, of course, yes. Yes, of course, truffles, which uh, many delicious uh, oak species, uh, fungal species. Uh, and they cannot be uh, cultivated. And really, if somebody even wants to somehow create a truffle colony, they have to really work on oak trees, not the truffle itself, because of that symbiosis, which I find quite beautiful. Yeah. And then there's, of course, the dogs and the pigs and the humans and this whole thing emerging. Um, so back to the garden for a minute. Um, why did you approach us? Why, why did you think uh, artists should come into the garden and do work, create installations, make comments? As an educator, researcher, deeply in sciences and uh, being a dean on top of it, quite busy, uh, what what made you think, wait, we should have some artists here? <laughs> well, you know, the garden is already a human-made construct, right? We we created this garden. Um, you know, Mildred Mathias, that the garden is named after, um, she started bringing in, using it to bring in lots of species. People use gardens to for aesthetic reasons, to bring a certain kind of beauty. So to me, a garden is really an art project. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't like to see the separation of individuals that study humanities or, and social sciences. I mean, when you think about poetry or any kind of artistic expression, a lot of it's around nature. So to me, to get um, the use, the appreciation of the garden more widely distributed, I think helps educate everyone about nature which I'm always trying to do is do it. And if you bring art into the garden, you make people more aware of nature. And we were locked out of the garden. Uh, so <laughs> initially when we talked, it was beautiful, open. A lot of the public would come. Uh, then it became open to the public certain times when the pandemic started locking down. Now it's completely locked down. Then we thought maybe we could come in with COVID uh, protocols and still manage to do something, but it's 
lockdown even more, which in a way is symbolic of the times we live in. So let's um, let's take a walk through the garden. We had to pre-record it, obviously, because we're locked out from the garden. <laughs> it's almost like a little garden of Eden where we've been thrown out. And um, uh, I will check if everybody's on. So we should go ahead and... Hi, I'm really happy to welcome you to our botanical garden where it gives me a chance to talk about plants and change and genes. And the point that I want to get across is that trees in particular are used to change. Nature is used to change. That's what it's all about. However, we're now having change that's faster than ever. So first I want to do is talk with you about a few of our trees that really, really illustrate how trees can actually live with change. And then I'm going to do is talk to you about my research that we get into. Well, they've lived with change. Can they continue to survive with the rapid change that we're now throwing up? So thank you for joining us in the garden. And let me get started by telling you why I wanted to stand next to this beautiful tree. So this tree is called the Meta Sequoia otherwise known as the Don Redwood. Many, many years, we all thought it was extinct. We found fossils in Asia. There have been fossils in North America, but they've never found a living population. That is until 1941 when it was discovered. And they found these isolated populations of this beautiful tree in a valley in China. Now at that time the war was going on, so it took a while before actually they were able to share this discovery with the world. But by 1946, they realized what a precious tree this is. This tree has got fossils that go back over 100 million years. And we know what happened 100 million years ago. The planet was warm. This was like the whole earth was tropical. So you could have things like a sequoia living in Northern Canada or in the Arctic and surviving because the climate was so warm. Then what happened is the climate cooled down, which it did but between the last 200 million years and the next 50 million years. It, it was warm, then it got cool. As it cooled, a lot of trees went extinct while other trees actually just moved their distribution. They kept shifting so they could go down to areas where they could survive. So this tree managed to find places that it could exist all of the relatives in North America went extinct, but we know they're here because of fossils. And then we have this lone living population of this beautiful tree. There's only three trees that we call redwoods or in that redwood group. It's this meta sequoia. It's the sequoia you find in California. And then it's the redwood, the coastal redwoods. All three of them, they're related. They're in the same family. None of them are in the same genus. So they're all kind of remnants of an ancient past. And what's interesting about this meta sequoia, we see these beautiful leaves. I hope you can get the light, sort of the sun shining through them. They go deciduous in the, um, they go deciduous in the winter. And that's very unusual for a conifer. There's only one other species that does that. And every year it means that our visitors think that this tree has died and they're very upset. But this is a very healthy tree. And just to give you an idea, this tree has only been here since the mid fifties. So it has gotten this big in a very short period of time. It's a very hardy tree and fast growing tree as long as it has lots of water. So to me, to have a species that's been able to survive over a hundred million years with all of the temperature changes and all the shifts in distribution is really special and shows you that long lived trees can actually persist and deal with the changes in climate that they've been dealt with over time. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is take you to an, another example of a long-lived tree uh, that has been used very much by humans and therefore perhaps many of you are familiar with it. So let's take a walk. So now I'm standing underneath an oak and oaks also have been around for over 100 million, 200 million years. And like the Metasequoia, 
they were probably evolved at a time, well, we know that they evolved at a time when the climate was much warmer. And we have many fossils from the Paleo-Arctic. So they also were existing in what do we now consider to be the coldest part of our planet in perfectly benign conditions. The difference between the oak and the stories that I can tell you with the ginkgo and the metasequoia is that oaks have survived by creating or evolving hundreds of species. In fact, oaks are one of the most speciose, that means they have the most species in Northern Hemisphere forests. And there's lots of reasons that oaks have been so successful. So when they did evolve in that area, they would, and the temperature started warming up about 15 million years ago, as they moved south, you had species becoming different in different areas and they evolved to different climates and they evolved to different conditions. So instead of just having one species that was able to come and have very selective areas and niches that it survived in, what oaks did was they just went everywhere. And it's really fascinating. How is it that so many species evolved? So right now in North America, we have more species of oaks than pines and we have more biomass of oaks. So you'd have to say this species has been incredibly successful and dealing with change in a different way. Dealing with change by evolving species that could focus and specialize on its own local conditions. The oak I'm standing under is not one of the oaks that I study. One of the oaks that I study is called Valley Oak. It's a California endemic oak. And most of you may know about oaks because you see the acorns, the squirrels feed on them, the birds eat them, the woodpeckers thrive and carry them, and some of them make granaries and stick the acorns. So when we go out for hikes uh, in many parts of North America, we're very familiar with oaks and um, what, how valuable they are to nature. My valley oak, there was a specimen here, and valley oak, in this species in California is the one that I've been focusing all my efforts. And unfortunately, the specimen here got destroyed by ambrosia beetle, so an introduced pest. So despite the fact that valley oak has lived in California for over 20 million years, it's also vulnerable to the human-induced changes that we're putting into its atmosphere. Now I want to talk about the genetic uh, portion of my story. Now, why do I care about genetics? I told you in the beginning that I'm interested in the evolutionary biology of trees. But the wonderful part about genes, and especially DNA sequences, is that they can give you the complete evolutionary history of a species and its ancestors. So for instance, we were able to sequence the DNA of valley oak, which I've talked about, one tree. And from that one tree, we can see what were its population sizes over the last 50 million years? And what we found out by looking at these sequences of DNA was that actually in the last 50 million years, oak populations have been declining. The effective size of populations has been going down. And you think, wait a minute, you just told me they're the most dominant group, tree group, uh, in Northern Hemisphere. How can they be declining? Well. It's a matter of scale, because what's happened over the last 50 million years is the planet's gotten cooler. So when the Arctic became less tropical, the oaks moved south, as I mentioned earlier, but it's all in response to climate. And in this case, they moved around, they speciated, and so that resulted in overall smaller population size as they subdivided. So we can get that information by looking at the DNA sequences. Oh, what else can DNA tell us? Well, DNA is, of course, the basis of genes. And if we're interested in whether trees, how they're going to continue to respond to climate change, we want to find the genes that are associated with responding to climate over the last, you know, 20,000, 100,000 years. So we have done a study by looking at the genome of Valley Oak, where we can do is pick out the genes that actually tell us a story about how oaks have responded to climate change and how different populations of oaks have different genes that allow them to deal with different con conditions. So we began this story about 10 years ago 
It's a field of biology called landscape genomics, which we look at genes on the landscape. And we got a very surprising story. What we found was that actually these oak populations in terms of instead of being adapted to the local conditions are adapted to temperatures about 20,000 years ago. So they're out of sync with our current temperatures. Now, by being out of sync, that makes me a little worried because if they're already out of sync on the order of 20,000 years, how are they gonna to respond to temperature change over 50 years? So all of this requires first that we have a very high quality genome. All of you are familiar with the Human Genome Project, I'm sure. You know when we say, oh, there's a gene for this trait or a gene for breast cancer or a gene for Alzheimer's, it's because we've sequenced the human genome and now we've done it many times and it yields lots of information that's helpful. Well, Valley Oak has now got the best, highest quality genome in the world. And there's really only two other species of oaks that have a genome. Okay, so as you can see, I'm standing in front of an oak. Maybe you can tell that uh, it's a cork oak which has got a very, very thick trunk, and most humans know it because if you drink wine, you're very used to uncorking the bottle in order to get your evening sustenance. But what's interesting about the oak is that right now, there's only three species of oaks that we actually have the genome. Why is the genome so important? Well, just like, I, just like you have the human genome, which has helped us identify genes for lots of different traits, it helps come up with health solutions, it helps us identify who's related to whom. Well, in this case, having the oak genome really helps us look at the genes associated with traits that can respond to climate change. So this is one of the oaks that we have a genome on and Valley Oak, the one that I study, has a very high quality genome uh, that gives us precise information for all 12 chromosomes. So back to genes. Well, knowing the genes helps us understand are oaks going to respond to climate change? And there's two ways to think about how can we figure out if oaks are going to respond to climate change. Well, one is valley oak is distributed in Southern California where it's hot and dry. It's also distributed in Northern California where it's cooler and wetter. Are the genes for oaks the same in Southern California and Northern California? Are oaks just able to tolerate whatever climate conditions you give it, which would be good news because maybe they can tolerate future climate change? There's two ways to answer that question. One way is to look at our genome, sample, sample oak leaves all over California, and then sequence the DNA in those oak leaves and figure out how different are individuals. But of course, we're interested in the genes associated with traits that will allow them to tolerate changes in climate conditions. So one way we do that is we take acorns from those trees from all over California and we put them in one garden. And if they all grow the same in the garden, that means that they can do put them in any environment and they're fine. But the extent to which different individual trees who are from different parts grow differently, that tells us they have a different response to climate. Well, the answer turns out, yes, genetically they're very different and that the trees in the cooler, wetter parts of California do not do as well when they go to hotter conditions. And the trees in Southern California have genes that do a little bit better in, con in conditions. So who's gonna be able to tolerate and survive this rapid climate change? Well, it's a big question because I've just told you that they're all adapted to climates 20,000 years ago. So they've all used to cooler conditions. So what we did is we did an experiment where we combined our genomic data and our growth data and we said which genes will predict who's going to grow well under good climate conditions. Then we did a climate warming model and we put it all together and we asked if we were to plant acorns that have a high frequency of genes that grow well under warm conditions can we get better growth in future populations? And the answer to that is yes, we can use genes to actually help trees do better under warmer climates. And this is called genome assisted migration. 
because it's looking increasingly clear if we want to continue to have oak populations and oak ecosystems, we might have to help them along. And you think, well, are you going to cut down the trees? Well, actually, frequently, we're now restoring habitats where people have cut down oak ecosystems and we're replanting. So this helps people decide what should we replant them with. Or all these fires that are burning down the oak forests. Those fires are generating the need to replant with new oaks. So you could decide, oh, I'll just plant the oaks with local acorns. Or I can plant oaks with that we know have a higher frequency of genes that can tolerate. So again, we took our data and we said, okay, if we compared, if we just use local seeds and we compared it with oaks that have more good genes for warm climates, how much better will they be under climate change in 50 years? And the ones that are genome assisted selection have much growth, better growth rates all over California. So we know, going back to, that genes may provide us a tool to deal with the change. That these long-lived individuals, oaks can live 250 years, and this long-lived species are gonna be able to deal with the rapid change in the climate that we're throwing at them. So I hope you've enjoyed this short walk through the garden and the stories about tree, what trees can tell us. I think what we've seen is some trees have been amazingly successful at dealing with the changes in climate and the changes in distribution over time and that we can even think about them for the last hundred million years. But there's, of course there's lots of other trees that weren't so resilient, didn't survive, uh, didn't make it because as climate changed even slowly, it just became less uh, hospitable for them. So. Trees can tell us a lot. What I like about DNA is that it can tell you the history of the trees. We can learn a lot from fossils, but, but just by studying our living materials, DNA can give you the history. The other thing the DNA can do is help us understand the genes that are really associated with some of the changes they've dealt with and are gonna be helping us understand how can we help trees survive in the future and deal with this rapid climate change that for an individual plant that lives 100 to 500 years is going to have to struggle with it otherwise. So we've got a story here of trees and the history of change and the history of why genes gives us a hidden information about them. Thank you for joining me in the garden. school and you know suicide etc and yet it's such an oasis and there's over 2,000 species in there so it's incredible for people to find I can see where um, the city got worried about us attracting people to the garden because they would have you know and it, the it, it was it was amazing people were taking the bus and walking in and which was what I want you yes. know yeah. uh, so we have to get back to the garden somehow. But uh, speaking of species, one of the species that we talked about and it would be interesting to share with the public is the ginkgo, which is very popular in health food and um, immunity, etc. Can you tell us a little bit about it, the ginkgo plant? Well, the ginkgo... I think is, is a very interesting story because some people refer to it as a living fossil. It's this uh, particular species. It's a very primitive species. It's been around um, for over 200 million years. And I talked about how oaks have been evolved around 50 million years. So this gives you an idea of how old the ginkgo is. When I think about the ginkgo though, I think about, can you imagine how many changes have taken place on earth in that period of time? You know, it was warm and then it was cold. And, you know, there's been all sorts of different species around it that didn't occur, like insect species and pathogens that occur now that, that were not even present then. And so 
I just find what a resilient, resilient species to have been around for so long. And then even the tree itself, it, it can live a few thousand years. So the tree itself, not just the species, has incredible longevity. And I think that it's the uh, fact that it has all these genes, resistant genes for diseases, for um, insects, has certainly been part of that success. And it's probably those kinds of uh, chemistry of this tree that's also been why humans have used it for medicinal purposes. So it's, it's, a, it's a great story the tree that we have in the garden is rather interesting because it is obviously not a very old tree. It's only been here about you know, 10 years or so, but it's actually the progeny of a ginkgo that survived the bombing of Hiroshima. And so the, the tree actually continues to show its resiliency. And now it's a symbol of just sort of, of peace and cooperation that, uh, the society that's been of uh, this that's from Japan wants to promote peace and not war has used it to distribute all over the world and tell that story. Um, so beautiful. And is it indigenous to Asia or where is it? Yeah, so it's it's indigenous and found. Um, well, I don't remember its long, worldwide distribution, but now it's found in uh, Japan and Asia mm -hmm. uh, where it's had a long you know, history of being used by human societies. So the the botanical garden is actually not that old, and it's uh, <laughs> yes. over two thousand species, which is like Los Angeles in many ways. Can you tell us how it evolved? I mean, how did it happen that we suddenly have this little oasis patch on campus? I mean, when you see these trees that are so tall and you come into the garden, it feels almost like an arboretum um, because there's so many tall trees. But when you consider most of those trees have only been planted here 50, maybe 75 years ago. So this little you know, oasis of trees that have come from all over the world did not, we're not even here a hundred years ago. A hundred years ago, this was just a cleared land for, you know, for a citrus grove and before that, um, you know, it was being, you know, it was an arroyo, a chaparral with, with oaks and elderberry and, um, you know, just a sage growing through this arroyo, which for us means like a little canyon with a stream going through it. So we transformed that area at a relatively short period into this area that's got trees from all over the world. What's nice about this botanical garden is it never has frost so we can grow trees from subtropical areas and even tropical areas uh, that many botanical gardens can't grow and often because of the climate being so pleasant the trees grow very big and very tall so many of our specimens here are larger than where you find them in in other botanical gardens what what i think that means is we can tell lots of stories you know, like I told the story about the ginkgo and, and I told the story about the metrocidrus, the Don Redwood that was um, given to us uh, from China, is that we can plant things to teach students about, you know, different ecosystems. We can plant trees to have uh, for preservation of the species. And so people who want to have a living museum can come to our garden. And uh, I think that just makes it a very, very special place, but it also means that it's completely out of the human imagination. It's mm -hmm. whatever we decide to create. And I think going back to our earlier conversation, it's why to me, of course we want artists here. Um, you know, scientists and plant biologists have been basically creating their own artistic uh, piece through this garden by deciding what to plant and where to plant it. And uh, that kind of creativity is what I, I admire in artists. Uh, well, thank you for having us. And I have to say that one thing that we do is storytell and build community. And there's been such a incredible movement with artists working with biology that is 
a really good sign going even to the fact that a lot of materials used traditionally in fine arts, for instance, are quite toxic. And to, to think about uh, the whole ecosystem and how even a pencil is related to deforestation and telling these stories in relation to nature and community is just so critical right now. And to um, have you open our festival is just so wonderful and we're so grateful because it goes so well with the topic that Ars Electronica picked, the idea of having gardens all around the world and there's 120 locations that created their garden, whether it's virtual or real or in, in our case, an actual botanical garden. It's just a fabulous idea. And I think that we want to get back to the garden because we're a billion old carbon. <laughs> and we uh, are making a first step by being locked out. We realize what we're missing and what we need. And by seeing all the devastation, we have our hearts broken and we want to somehow return to having this relationship with trees, with the network, the whole environment and ecology. So thank you for your beautiful research and for your openness and for giving us an opportunity to work in the garden. We have quite a few artists who are doing installations. Uh, we have workshops uh, in the garden. Uh, we have a graduate student who actually will focus his thesis by being in the garden. So all of this just makes it more possible to get back to the garden. Thank you, Victoria Sark. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you. And it's, um, I think what gardens do is they can open our eyes to the importance of nature. And it's really sad that as we become more technological, that we've lost track um, of the importance of nature. And that's one of the reasons the message about how we're altering the planet and we're changing nature faster than it's ever changed before. And so I see a garden as being a way to tell that story, make people uh, have the opportunity to connect. I see bringing artists in here. And I was totally excited when I realized that I've always known you for your fascinating work connecting science and art. But then I find out that you've got students who are trying to connect not just science, but biology in particular, mm -hmm. um, and using nature to art. So I love the, the merging of the two. And I think together we can tell a story that will help people understand why the planet needs all these species, why we need to keep the planet healthy. And um, so it's been really an honor to me for us to start developing a, a partnership and relationship about telling that story together. Thank you. And we'll continue this conversation in the panel on uh, urban landscapes and the garden later in the days. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll talk soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for this invitation. Of course. Bye. Bye.